Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Alaa Musbah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University. The topic of my lecture today about ectopic pregnancy. So what we wanted to discuss today, the definition, epidemiology and histopathology, clinical presentation and investigation and diagnosis, differential diagnosis and the treatment. Let us start with the definition. We can define ectopic pregnancy as a pregnancy which occurs when a developing embryo implants at a site other than the endometrium of the uterine cavity. All of us know the normal uterine cavity is here as in the picture. So implantation usually in the upper part of the uterus, posterior wall, anterior wall and the fundus. So any implantation of fertilized ova outside the normal endometrium in the uterine cavity is called ectopic pregnancy. And the commonest one is the tubal ectopic pregnancy, as you see in this picture. And the commonest site in, in, tube, in tubal ectopic is the ampullary portion of the ectopic constitutes 70% of the ectopic. While all tubal ectopic constitute more than 95% of all ectopic pregnancy. You can consider ectopic pregnancy as one of the most common gynecologic emergency. Yes. What about the epidemiology? The incidence of ectopic pregnancy about 2% of all pregnancies. The incidence among patients who utilize ART, assisted reproductive technology, is higher, nearly 5%. Accordingly, the ectopic pregnancy can be in the tubes, more common, 95%, as we mentioned before, especially in the ambulary region, this area, it's called ambulla, and this is called infundibular. In the ambulary region, it is 70%, while in the isthmus, it is 12%, this area is the isthmus, 12%. While in the fimbrial end, this part is 11%. Other areas with ectopic, like cervical ectopic, less than 1%, abdominal pregnancy, less than 1%, or 1%. Caesarean scar pregnancy is constitute 4% in cases with previous one caesarean section. And you can say one in 500 pregnancies as regard caesarean scar pregnancy. What are the risk factors? One of the most important risk factors is the period ectopic pregnancy. Ten times higher risk of recurrence than the general population. Tubal abnormalities, whatever congenital or acquired tubal damage, as in pelvic inflammatory disease or previous tubal surgery. Also, women with perihepatic adhesion which is a syndrome called the Fitz-Hogkert syndrome, associated with pelvic inflammatory disease, carries twice risk of ectopic pregnancy compared to unaffected women. Another important risk factors like genital surgery, endometriosis, and dysmenorrhea also constitutes an important risk factor. Smoking, Increase the risk of ectopic pregnancy up to twofold. Women with diagnosis of mental health problems, including anxiety, depression, maybe due to the disease itself or the hormonal effect in the body, or the treatment given in such conditions may be the cause and affecting tubal motility. Presence of intrauterine device in place with pregnancy is a risk factor for ectopic because IUD prevent intrauterine 
pregnancy but doesn't prevent the extra uterine one. Gestation only contraceptive pills is considered also risk factors due to the effect of gestation on the tubal motility. In vitro fertilization has a little increase in risk of ectopic pregnancy compared to natural conceptions. What about the path of physiology? The exact mechanism why implantation occur outside the normally trying cavity is unknown up till now, but there are four main possibilities. Either anatomic obstruction to the passage of the zygote in its uh, uh, journey through the tube to the uterine cavity, or abnormal conceptus where there is a premature implantation, or abnormalities in the mechanisms responsible for tubal motility may be related to effect of some hormones due to endocrine abnormalities, or abnormalities in transperitoneal migration of the zygote. As we mentioned before, the most common site for ectopic pregnancy is the ampullary region of the fallopian tube. Other sites like infundibular ismic portions also present and the fimbrial. What is the fate of tubal ectopic? Maybe the ectopic in the tube becomes separated from the wall and surrounded by, by blood. This is called tubal mold and leads to hematocelbex, collection of blood inside the tube. Or the separated fertilized ova expelled through the tube to the femoral end to the outside. This is called tubal apportion. Or there is tubal erosion. There is erosion in the wall of the tube and this may cause some bleeding. This is called pelvic hematocel. Or maybe tubal rupture and the causing internal hemorrhage, which may be severe enough to cause shock and the life threatening condition. What about caesarean scar pregnancy? The migration of blastocyst in the, in the myometrium due to residual scarring defect from period caesarean section. The depth of implantation determines the type of caesarean scar pregnancy, and we have two types actually. Type 1 and the type 2. Type 1, there is proximity to the uterine cavity more, and the thickness of the muscle myometrium is more than 3 millimeter. But in type 2, myometrium is less than 3 millimeter, it's very thin, and the, the implanted fertilized ova bulge through the serosa toward the zip ladder and if neglected may rupture and cause internal hemorrhage okay so i have type 1 and the type 2 according to the site of implantation and the grass of this conception towards the uterine cavity it is type 1 towards the surface of the uterus towards the bladder it is Type 2. What is the clinical presentation? First, you should take a full history from your patient, including menstrual, citric history, detect the gestational age, to know if there is missed period or more, and evaluate all risk factors in all women of reproductive age. Women with an ectopic pregnancy usually present with short period of amenorrhea, maybe some pregnancy, early pregnancy symptoms also. Then abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, sometimes shoulder pain due to peritoneal irritation by blood. Gastric and sinus symptoms and sometimes syncope or fainting attacks. So, ectopic pregnancy may be intact or ruptured one. And ruptured one may be acute or chronic disturbed one. So, the clinical presentation of the patient may be 
those who have an acute abdomen with hemodynamic instability and in whom immediate surgery is indicated, those with ruptured one. And the other women, those who are clinically stable and in whom adjunctive diagnostic procedures can be performed, those with intact ectopic one, not disturbed yet. Okay? What is very important is, is to do pregnancy test, and we can do it in urine or serum beta HCG, and also transvaginal ultrasound to detect the location of the pregnancy. What about physical examination? The vital signs is very important. There may be tachycardia, hypotension, due to blood loss in acute cases, you disturb it, one. And there is pallor due to hemorrhage. Abdominal examination should focus on the location of the tenderness in one iliac region, in suprapubic area, whatever. And what is exacerbating this pain? There may be guarding of the abdominal musculature, elicited on palpation. This may indicate there is free fluid, I mean blood, or other causes of retinal irritation. There may be shifting dullness due to presence of free fluid, cooling the signs with blowish discoloration around the umbilicus in case of internal hemorrhage. With bimanual examination, you will find the uterus just bulky, soft, that suggesting pregnancy, but not excluding the presence of ectopic or heterotopic pregnancy. Mobility of the cervix associated with pain towards the side of the ectopic. This is called do the sign. Tenderness in the posterior fornix, and this is called Johnson sign. There may be, on bimanual examination, tender ill-defined at the next cell mass, vary in size on the affected side. What is the investigation needed? Serial, serial quantitative beta HCG, the syrup, can be helpful in determining if the current pregnancy is likely to be an ectopic location. Okay, what is the normal? The beta HCG level rises sleep, steeply, gradually, in the first four weeks, followed by slower rise until 10 weeks, gestational age, then plateau, in, in most normal intratrum pregnancy, you, the beta HCG doubled within 48 hours. What about the discrimination zone? The relation between the serum beta HCG, if reaching 1,500 to 2,000, I should see intratrine sac by transvaginal ultrasound. So, absence of a sac with this touch of beta HCG may suggest ectopic pregnancy. The use of discriminatory beta HCG level to determine when an intratrine pregnancy should be visible in ultrasound nowadays is discouraged by some obstetrician. Why? It is now widely acknowledged that beta HCG can be non-specific as many ectopic pregnancy will never reach the level of 2,000 international urate per liter or might rupture before that threshold. Conversely, women who have had multiple gestation have a higher beta HCG level than women who have a single gestation. And using 2,000 international unit per liter as a discriminatory value might not be accurate for such pregnancies. This is the important points why recently some obstetrician discouraged the use of discriminatory zone as an important for diagnosing ectopic pregnancy. So, not to mistake or to manage a case as ectopic and it is not or the reverse. 
What about transvaginal ultrasound? Transvaginal uh, ultrasound is one of the most important to diagnose intratrium pregnancy, as you see in the picture, seeing the gestational sac inside the uterus at the age of five weeks. Then yolk sac, the earless structure to develop inside the sac is normally seen by five weeks and the five days of pregnancy. This is the yolk sac and this is the gestational sac. Gestational sac at five weeks can be seen by TBS. Yolk sac developed five weeks plus five days. So transvaginal ultrasonography give higher resolution and they can detect ear pregnancy as I mentioned. Presence of an intrauterine pregnancy, gestational sac, yolk sac, or embryo, and transvaginal ultrasound effectively eliminate the diagnosis of an ectopic pregnancy. So if you see intrauterine pregnancy, so this case is not an ectopic. It's just intrauterine, normal intrauterine pregnancy. Okay? Okay. However, you should know the rare cases of heterotopic pregnancy in which there is intrauterine pregnancy and another pregnancy, extrauterine or ectopic pregnancy. So you should put it in your mind if the patient is symptomatic and you are thinking about ectopic and there is signs of symptoms and signs of ectopic while you are seeing intrauterine pregnancy, please search in the adenexal region, search for ectopic pregnancy because the case may be heterotopic pregnancy. Okay, what are the signs detected by transvaginal ultrasound in case of tubal ectopic? You can see gestational sac outside the uterine cavity in the adrenal region. This sac containing yolk sac, containing fetal pool and the pulsation, and this definitely diagnostic. No need for another investigations to diagnose more than that. If I have a gestational sac, the yolk sac, the fetal pool pulsating one, this is diagnostic. But this is not commonly seen like that. What is common is to see, like this picture, heterogeneous echogenicity or inhomogeneous echogenicity, tuber ring, like that, free float in the Douglas pouch. All these are signs of ectopic by TBS. So, pupil ring, inhomogeneous echogenicity, free float and Douglas pouch, all these are signs of ectopic pregnancy. And by color doubler, you can see the ring of fire. This is the ring of fire due to placental blood supply, plastic blood vessels. So, you can see the ring of fire by color doubler. What about the callosynthesis? Callosynthesis may be indicated sometimes to confirm the diagnosis, as you see in the picture. We insert cascus speculum, then elevate a posterior lap of the cervix, then through the Douglas pouch, insert the needle in through the posterior fornix in the Douglas pouch and the aspirate. If the aspirate was blood, this is positive callosynthesis. If it is clear fluid, it is negative callosynthesis. If no fluid at all, it is called non-diagnostic callosynthesis. Is laparoscopy has a rule? Yes, of course. Laparoscopy has a rule, an important rule, as you see in this picture. This is the left ectopic, pubal ectopic pregnancy. Important in diagnosis early ectopic and also as a therapeutic missile. So laparoscopy can be used as a diagnosis and the therapeutic at the same time to do, for example, for this case, left salpingectomy. Okay, and you can have a lock to the right tube if it is healthy. You can remove this, and remove this tube with the topic inside. It's called left salpingectomy. Okay.
what is the differential diagnosis of topic pregnancy pelvic inflammatory disease tube ovarian abscess hemorrhagic corpus luteum ovarian torsion or ovarian disruption threatened miscarriage or incomplete miscarriage appendicitis ureteric calculi or stool what is the treatment of fallopian tube ectopic pregnancy? I have three lines of treatment. Expectant management. Watch the patient to see the progress. If regressing the beta HCG till reaching the normal level becomes negative, this is the expectant management. Medical treatment using mistrixate therapy. Surgical management as salpingectomy or salpingotomy. This is the expectant management. You do follow up for the patient. Who is the patient you choose for expectant management? The patient with a very low tetra, less than 1,000 international units per liter. Very early pregnancy. No mass detected or very small in size not disturbed one so you can watch just observe your patient and alarm the patient about the signs of disturbed ectopic like shoulder pain abdominal pain vaginal bleeding and so on so you just do follow up and do serial beta, C, beta hcg level in the plot you should follow till reaching the level of negative beta hcg okay what is very important to know that this woman with expectant management if successful has 2.6 times higher risk of recurrent ectopic pregnancy than other women okay medical treatment include mesotrexate started in 1982 the mechanism as a mistrixate act as a folate antagonist that prevent DNA replication and affect rapidly proliferating cells like that of developing embryo. What is the dose? The dose is 50 milligram per square meter intramuscular. Its effectiveness is assessed by serial beta HCG measurement on day four and seven. So you should ask the patient to do serum beta HCG at day four and seven. Then weekly until resolution. I expect the re reduction beta HCG should be more than 15% in day four to seven. Okay, but if there is no decline, means I need another dose of mesotrexate. A second dose should be given if there is no decrease by 15% at least in days 4 to 7, okay? Then close observation is very important and required to ensure patient stability. As you know, we are afraid from rupture ectopic at any time, which may be suddenly and may cause shock, may be life-threatening. So it's very important to observe the patient and take care about this be careful that the patient should have a normal liver function test before you give mistrixate because mistrixate has a side effects on the liver the beta hcg level at presentation is, is strongly associated with treatment success of a single dose of mistrixate injection it is suggested by the guidelines to give mistrixate therapy if the tetra is less than 5,000 international units, the tetra of beta HCG serum level, less than 5,000 international units per liter. Okay? So, what is the contraindication to mistrixate? If beta HCG is higher than 5,000, I'm not go going to give the patient mistrixate or the ectopic mass is more than 3.5 centimeter or there is 
fetal heartbeat on transvaginal ultrasound. Why? Because they might indicate a more developed embryo with increased risk of ectopic rupture. So, it is not advised to give mistrixate in such conditions. It is important to take sample for CBC and baseline liver and renal function lab results and to monitor liver function during treatment. Patient should also be advised to stop folate containing supplements because they inhibit mesotrixate function. Don't forget about that because usually the patient before pregnancy and in early pregnancy they are taking folic acid supplementation. So don't forget to ask her to stop this folate containing supplements during mesotrixate therapy because it inhibits the function of the mesotrixate. What is important also to advise the patient to avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Why? Because the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs reduce renal clearance of the drug by reducing renal blood flow, leading to more side effects of accumulated mesotrixate. So what is the side effects of mesotrixate? The side effects including diarrhea, nausea, conjunctivitis, hematitis, hepatic dysfunction, and the serious complications like anaphylaxis, pulmonary damage, and myelosuppression, although it is rare. Mistrixate shouldn't be administered to patients with liver or renal function, lung disease, hematologic dysfunction, immunodeficiency, or peptic ulcer disease, or for breastfeeding women. Given that this is an outpatient treatment, this is an outpatient treatment, and an ectopic pregnancy may rupture during therapy, it is important to alert patient to symptoms of rupture the ectopic pregnancy and to seek immediate medical attention if they okay, because this is an emergency situation, and all of us know that rupture may happen at any time. So we should alarm the patient about this carefully. There is some medical treatment under trial, not proved, just in researches, GnRH agonist and the literozole, GnRH agonist, it has been demonstrated that gonadotropin releasing hormone and the ATS receptor are expressed in trophoblastic cells and the fallopian tube epithelium at ectopic pregnancy implantation sites. That's why we are trying to use GnRH agonist as a medical treatment for ectopic. Litrozole, we know that litrozole belongs to aromatase inhibitor that block, blocks the final step of estrogen senses. Through this mechanism, we are trying to use it as a medical treatment of ectopic and the research is under trial study. What about surgical management? Laparoscopy or laparotomy? Laparoscopy is the gold standard for treating ectopic pregnancy and has mostly replaced laparotomy. I need laparotomy only when the patient is hemodynamically unstable, there is severe internal hemorrhage for better visualization of the field. Otherwise, I use laparoscopy for most of the cases. It's safer, faster, and cheaper, and more effective option. I have two surgery. Either I do salpingectomy, as in this picture. I remove the whole tube with the ectopic inside. Or I do salpingotomy. I do incision in the anti-mesenteric border, as here. This is the incision. Then remove the product of conception. Okay. Then control the bleeding and do hemostasis. Then if you left it open, it is called salpingotomy. If you suture it interrupted with 7-0 becquerel suture, interrupted in two layers or one layer, this is called salpingotomy. Okay? This is the difference between salpingotomy and salpingostomy. In salpingostomy, I leave it open after hemostasis, while in salpingotomy, I repair 
and two layer with interrupted sutures. When to use salpingectomy or to use salpingotomy or salpingectomy, I lock, I wanna during laparoscopy to lock to the other tube. If the contralateral tube, the other tube is healthy, so I'll do salpingectomy for sure. Laparoscopic salpingectomy is the best to avoid recurrence of ECPOP or persistence of trophoplastic tissue or reductive conception. So recurrence or the resistance may happen. So, in, in, if the other tube is healthy, I remove the, the pathologic tube, the ecopic one. I'll do salvinject. But if the other tube is unhealthy or removed before, and the patient wanna to preserve fertility and wanna to be natural conception. So, now I'm I give advantage to salpingotomy by doing incision, as you as you see here, in the antimesentric border, removal of the product of conception, hemostasis, and the closure by interrupted stitches in one or two layer with seven zero suture. Okay, what is the risk of salpingotomy? Salpingotomy has a risk of resistant tissue, trophoblastic tissue, so recurrence of care or recurrence next in next pregnancy of ectopic either persistence of trophoblastic tissue and complications or in next pregnancy may the risk of ectopic is higher so salpingectomy is considered the best but salpingectomy if the other tube is not present and the patient wanna to preserve her natural fertility. What about treatment of coronal pregnancy? What is a coronal ectopic pregnancy? Really, we consider coronal ectopic pregnancy the implantation and the development of gestation in a rudimentary horn or in one horn of septate or bicarnate uterus. Also, an interstitial portion of the fallopian tube and in lateral angle of the uterine cavity, what's called angular pregnancy, all these many obstetricians consider it as one item which is called coronal ectopic pregnancy. Can be diagnosed by using 2D ultrasound, transepagenic ultrasound. But better with 3D multiplanar ultrasound because facilitate visualization of the interstitial tube, helping to differentiate between intrauterine pregnancy and the interstitial pregnancy. Early diagnosis and treatment is very important. Why? Because risk of rupture increase beyond 12 weeks and will be horrible bleeding. With severe internal hemorrhage, maybe shock and death, if not managed urgently. Treatment: Nistrixate may be used either by systemic or local injection, or combination. If the condition is stable and diagnosed early, you can start medical treatment. Yes. Resection of the affected part of the uterus in patients who want to preserve uterus either by laparoscopy or laparotomy. And lastly, hysterectomy in patients who don't want to preserve uterus. What about ovarian pregnancy? The symptoms and signs simulating tubal pregnancy. You can differentiate tubal pregnancy from ovarian pregnancy by laparotomy or laparoscopy. And there is certain criteria called Spielberg criteria for diagnosing ovarian pregnancy. Look to this picture, please. This picture by laparoscopy. This is the uterus and this is the right ovary. Okay. This is the ovarian ectopic pregnancy, this part. What is the Spielberg criteria? The fallopian tube on the same side should be healthy. As you look here, 
this filament tube is healthy. The, the ectopic should be at the side of the ovary. As you see here in the picture, this ectopic is a part of the ovary. And the ovarian tissue present in the capsule of the gestational sac. If we excise this sac, we will find ovarian tissue surrounding another important site. And the ovary is connected to the uterus by the ovarian ligament. Okay? To define the ovary. Okay? This is the Spielberg criteria to define ovarian pregnancy. How to manage? Conservative treatment, sorry. Conservative treatment with medical treatment like mesotrexate can be used in early stage patients with hemodynamic stability. But the classic surgical approach of the disease with open or laparoscopic access is either ophrectomy or adenosectomy for cases diagnosis, diagnosed late and is accompanied by severe bleeding. So, ophrectomy or adenosectomy is a better choice. Or another operation which is wedge resection of the ovary, the removal of this gestational sac and the product of conception, and the suturing of the remaining ovarian tissue. Okay, this is the another surgery. What about cervical pregnancy? Cervical pregnancy, as you see in this picture, and in this ultrasound picture. This is the gestation sac, this is the fetal pool. This is the internal os closed, should be closed to differentiate it from cervical portion. Internal os closed, external os closed, and the placenta is attached to the cervix glands, cervical glands surround the placenta. This is very dangerous type of ectopic because may be associated if disturbed with horrible bleeding and shock. Grouping criteria for diagnosis of cervical ectopic include the attachment of the placenta to the cervix is located below the entrance of the drive visit. Fetal parts must not be present in the drive corpus, so the drive cavity should be empty. The placental attachment to the cervix must be intimate. Cervical gland must be present opposite the placental attachment site. Okay, if fulfilling all these criteria, it's called the Rubin criteria. This is diagnosed for cervical ectopic, of course, diagnosed with TBS, as I mentioned before, as in this picture. How to manage cervical ectopic? You can use tamponade with full caster. Usually after the retage, because of bleeding, you insert full caster as in this picture and inflate the balloon with 30 milli saline to do compression. Okay. Another line of treatment is to reduce the blood supply through cervical circulation or vaginal ligation of cervical arteries or ligation of uterine artery or internal iliac artery or through angiographic embolization of the cervical uterine or internal iliac arteries. Another line of treatment is systemic chemotherapy like mesotrexate. Another line of treatment is to do excision of trophoblast through curettage or through hysterectomy and removal of the cervix with the ectopic. Curitage is fertility preserving method, but risks of hemorrhage. Therefore, it has been in conjunction with mechanical method like cervical artery ligation and tamponade with full caster, as I mentioned before. Or to do primary hysterectomy, total hysterectomy with removal of the cervix and the ectopic inside. If the patient don't want to preserve her uterus and the completed with family, so you can do it in cases, especially in cases with severe hemorrhage and in second trimester cervical pregnancy to avoid emergency surgery and the blood transfusion. Okay? 
Another line of treatment is to do intraamnetic peptide like potassium chloride or injection of mesenchymal state inside the sac under under ultrasound guide. What about abdominal pregnancy? This is a very rare type of ectopic pregnancy, constituting nearly less than one percent. Developing embryo implants and the growth within the peritoneal cavity. Advanced abdominal pregnancy is an expression used when the pregnancy continues beyond the 20 weeks gestational with the fetus living or showing signs of having once lived and developed in the mother's abdominal cavity. Abdominal pregnancy constitutes 1.4% all ectopic pregnancy or less than that two types primary and secondary primary is direct implantation of conceptus into abdominal cavity while the secondary one due to fimbrial portion so it started as a pupil pregnancy in the fimbrial area or pupil rupture and this go that conception becomes implanted in the abdomen in work or rupture of the uterus with the escape of the product conception to be implanted outside the uterus or ruptured coronal pregnancy. So, maybe primary from the start, abdominal or secondary. Ultrasound will define there is no uterine wall surrounding the gestational sac. Uterus is small and empty. Of course, the baby takes an abnormal line representation in the abdomen magnetic resonance imaging may be helpful in diagnosis of early abdominal pregnancy maternal mortality with early abdominal pregnancy is high because such a pregnancy typically implant on highly vascularized surfaces and they can separate at any time during the gestation resulting in severe bleeding. The most important factors that influence survival and the management modality include maternal hemodynamic status and gestational age at the time of presentation. You can give the patient medical treatment in the form of mesotrexate, either systemic and local one. Also, you can give local potassium chloride or hyperosmolar glucose or prostaglandin and the methylprostol intra amniotic inside the sac, the gestational sac. Where potential life threatening bleeding is anticipated, such as early abdominal pregnancy of the liver and the spleen. Surgical management, in most cases, a multidisciplinary approach is in anticipation of possible life threatening bleeding during the operation. As you see here, this is during laparoscopy, this is the baby head, this is abdominal pregnancy, and this is the uterus. This is also abdominal pregnancy after removal from the abdomen through laparotomy. So I can do laparoscopy or laparotomy, but in advanced abdominal pregnancy, I need laparotomy. Then I remove the second fetus and the removal of the placenta. If the placenta attached to removable structure like omentum, I can excise it, the placenta and this structure easily. But the problem is if the placenta attached to an important structure like aorta or liver, this is a problem. I need to give mistrixate therapy. To have placental involution. What about cesarean scar pregnancy? It's ultrasound criteria for diagnosis of intrauterine pregnancy. Please look to this picture and this picture. The first picture up here to diagnose cesarean scar pregnancy, there must be empty uterine cavity and the empty cervical canal. Here, there is empty uterine cavity and empty cervical canal. The stational sac embedded in the side of the scar of previous cesarean section, as here. Around oval 
cheap gestation sack that filled the niche of the scar. Yes, the sack here is filling the niche of the scar. Absent or thin my material layer between the gestational sac and the bladder from 2 mm to 4.5 mm. This area, this sac, this is a muscle between the bladder and the sac. The area of this muscle between 2 mm to 4.5 mm. There is vascularization around the scar by Doppler, by color Doppler, as you see here, this vascularity with high velocity and low impedance blood flow. Okay, around the scar here. Lastly, negative organ sliding sign. If you move the vaginal probe, if there is intra-trime pregnancy, the there is gestational sac moving, okay? But if there is cesarean scar pregnancy, there is no movement of the sac. So we call it negative sliding sign. How to manage? I have different lines of treatment, as you see. Expected management, watch. If the threat of serum pH is low, you can follow up, do follow up till reaching zero level or medical management using systemic mesotrexate which is very common to give mesotrexate 50 milligram per square meter according to the body surface area usually we use combination therapy of mesotrexate and another method like sac aspiration local injection of mesotrexate or other embryocytes you try an artery chemoembolization or surgical management like dilatation and surgical evacuation or hysteroscopic resection or vaginal excision and the resuturing or through laparotomy or laparoscopic excision if type 2 scar pregnancy or combined laparoscopic or hysteroscopic and hysteroscopic or combined laparoscopic and the vaginal surgery or using focused ultrasound ablation or hysterectomy. As I said, I may use combined or sequential management. You try an artery embolization, hemoembolization, followed by DNC or surgical resection in 24 to 48 hours. This is called sequential management. Okay? What about heterotopic pregnancy? Heterotopic pregnancy is defined as the coexistence, presence of intratrime pregnancy and the ectopic pregnancy. As you see in this picture, simultaneous presence of intratrime pregnancy as this one and the ectopic pregnancy as this one at the same time. The incidence one, there are 30,000 pregnancy in a spontaneous pregnancy. But recently, the incidence is up to 1%. Why? Because of increasing tubal factor fertility and the infertility treatment like ovulation induction, assisted reproductive techniques. That's why the incidence increased. The ectopic gestational sac of heterotopic pregnancy can be located at the fallopian tube uterus cervix, uterus corner, previous cesarean, scar, or even in the abdomen. Ectopic pregnancy of heterotopic pregnancy can be treated by sonographic guided embryo aspiration with or without potassium chloride injection and or mesotrexate in the gestational sac laparoscopic surgery or laparotomy. So, these are different lines of treatment. Thank you. I'm Dr. Alam Musbah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, 
منصورة في